Uh, well, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, attending our Baby Bonds Policy Forum this afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to be um, with everyone who's online. Uh, really great to see the support uh, and the interest in this really innovative uh, policy idea. Before we get started with the panel and uh, introduce the panelists, I did want to in invite up Scott Giles, <laughs> who is the uh, CEO of VSAC, and thank him for hosting us uh, this afternoon, and uh, he's going to offer a welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Treasurer Pichek. Thank you very much for uh, organizing this forum and for serving on the VSEC Board of Directors. So I would be remiss if I didn't start out by thanking uh, both Treasurer Pichek and Senator uh, kind of Rom Hinsdale for the support that they have provided to us through the years. And it's great to see all of our friends out here. I see a bunch of old faces, a former Education Committee Chair, uh, some friends from uh, the NEA and, and elsewhere who've been long partners with us. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with us, um, we are the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation, and I think very apropos of today's conversation. Uh, we were created in 1965, really with the mission of making sure that all Vermonters, uh, particularly those who thought that the doors of opportunity were closed to them, would have access to the education and training that they need in order to be able to achieve their career and, and life goals. So I think like everybody in this room, we are very, very interested to learn more about this exciting new initiative and uh, wanted to formally welcome all of you on behalf of the staff and board of ESEC. Treasurer Pichek, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thank you very much. And we're also uh, fortunate to be joined by some representatives from our uh, congressional delegation. So. First, I'll invite up Katie, who uh, is the state director for Senator Bernie Sanders. Um, uh, I'll turn over to you, Katie. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thanks so much, Scott. Thank you very much for hosting us. Hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Katie. Oh, Gwen can take my seat. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, I'm Katie Van Hastem, Senator Sanders State Director. I'm really happy to be here today um, to say just a couple of words um, to maybe give a little grounding in the national discussion um, about what we're talking about here in Vermont. So Senator Sanders is an original co-sponsor of the Senate legislation that would do exactly what we're talking about here in Vermont. Um, the legislation was introduced by Senator Booker of New Jersey and uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts. Um, it's, a, it's just a great, simple piece of legislation that would tackle economic injustice, break the cycle of poverty, look at um, cycles of racial injustice um, here in Vermont, the wealth gap between some of our more urban areas and our more rural areas, um, and we absolutely love that Vermont is not waiting for the federal government to act. A couple of you might know, things are a little slow sometimes down in D.C. So it's really lovely when states get a jump on what we're trying to do in Washington. We're going to keep that fight up in D.C., but in the meantime, we're really excited that Vermont is taking this step forward and seeing it as an opportunity when we act quickly and first, it can also be a great opportunity for our Vermont young people and families and people who maybe are thinking about coming to Vermont. Gosh, what an amazing opportunity if we are one of the first states in the country to do this great work. So Mike, thank you so much for giving me the chance to share Senator Sanders' support and I know I look forward to hearing more about what all of our panelists have to say. Thank you. Thanks so much, Katie. We have a representative from uh, Senator Welsh's office who's joining us virtually, uh, Fana, who um, unfortunately uh, we can't have her speak, so I'm going to say something on behalf of Senator Welsh here that he uh, sent to us. So uh, good afternoon and thank you for uh, participating in this important forum on baby bonds. Uh, I'm pleased to share that I've signed on to S441, the American Opportunity Accountants Act, which I believe is the bill that Katie was just referencing. Uh, which establishes tax-exempt American Opportunity Accounts to provide children at birth with $1,000 in savings uh, with annual contributions up to $2,000 depending on the family income. Uh, the accounts are available to children at age 18 for specific purposes, including educational expenses, home ownership, investment that provides long-term returns. Uh, this bill uh, and the proposal at the state level seek to combat generational poverty by providing vital funds to Vermonters who might otherwise struggle to earn an education or buy a home. So we thank Senator Welsh for that 
and Senator Sanders for their support, both at the federal level uh, and here at the local level. And I'd also like to invite up David Shear, who is the uh, state director for Representative Becca Ballant. David. Thank you, Mike. Um, I will keep it brief. I don't want to stand between all of you and what you are here for, which is a discussion of baby bonds. But the Congresswoman did just want to express her gratitude. Uh, she's very strongly supportive of this concept. She is grateful to the treasurer for, um, as Katie pointed out, helping Vermont lead the way, which is something that we do well and something that um, we will hopefully get the nation to follow on after we're successful here in Vermont on this. I'm making a prediction, but I hope that will be true. <laughs> and uh, so just want to express our grat to the Congresswoman's gratitude to you, to the work you're doing here, uh, and we hope to um, have the nation follow. Thanks, David. So with that, we can start with our esteemed panel, and maybe right out of the gate, I'll ask the panelists to provide an introduction and uh, an overview of just who they are and the work that they do and their interest in baby bonds, and then we'll get into uh, some Q&A. I have a number of questions, but we'll eventually see if you out here in the audience have questions. We're happy to send those to the panelists as well. So Senator Rominsa, why don't we begin with you? Absolutely. It's very, very loud to move. Can, I, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, well, first of all, I feel like I'm sitting amongst some very esteemed um, intellectual powerhouses up here. And, uh, you know, I have served in the legislature now going into my 13th, 14th year. Uh, I chair Senate Economic Development, Housing, and General Affairs. But I actually think my biggest qualification being up here is being a new mom. Um, you'll probably see a rainbow onesie clad, eight month old, <laughs> somewhere in the building with my wonderful intern Zoe. Um, but, you know, as we've been discussing for much of the day, um, it's really hard to sort out all of the financial instruments that usually people of privilege have a financial advisor to help them with, have you know a history of wealth in their family to draw on. Um, I feel very privileged in a lot of senses in what I could give my daughter, um, but in my family, you know, we had foreclosure, bankruptcy, homelessness. Um, you know, my parents ran an Irish pub in Los Angeles with money that they got from the Women's Bank of Los Angeles. So the idea of policy shaping your access to capital was a reality in my life from the start. And after they lost the business and got divorced, and with my dad being you know, an immigrant of limited means, I was cashing his checks in my bank account at the age of 14. I knew that if you were on the free lunch program, you could take the SATs for free and apply to college for free, and that's how I'm here today. So, you know, these are the types of policies that I want to get passed because most people in this country feel like the economy is rigged against them and making these tools available to them to feel empowered. You know, especially I'm thinking the treasurer has been talking about um, using unclaimed property as a first source of funding. If that gets people to say, hey, I might have unclaimed property. I want to see. Great. You know, I mean, we should be empowering people to feel like they can interact with government and take advantage of their rights and their privileges um, as, as residents and citizens. Uh, so it's just always a pleasure to work with the treasurer. I don't think I'm up here as like a, you know, intellectual, cerebral person on the panel, but just to say, we're gonna get this done. And actually, I look around the room, I see a lot of legislators, so many that I'm not gonna try and name all of them. Um, so many other people, city councilors, thought leaders, um, you know, all kinds of folks. This is the room to actually just get it done. So I'm glad there was some time to schmooze. Um, help me pass this when the treasurer came forward with a retirement savings um, opt out bill this past year. Our committee got it done in two days mm -hmm. because we just really trust the treasurer's capacity. He builds coalitions like these um, and we're really excited to get these tools into the hands of everyday Vermonters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. You ever feel like you got set up for failure? <laughs> <laughs> Say something smart. That that. <laughs> so I, I'm uh, Derek Hamilton. I am a professor of economics. I am the director of the Institute on Race, Power, and Political Economy at the New School. And I have a lot of Vermont connections as I sit here and realize 
Uh, I work with Chuck and, uh, and Ben Cohen with uh, Ben's Best Blends. And uh, I am a surrogate from the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign of 2016. Uh, I characterize myself as an economist that is vested in understanding the intersections of economics, politics, and identity group stratification. In other words, the ways in which we divide people into groups and place value on whether one group is more deserving or less deserving than the other. To me, all three of those things are interconnected and not separable. Uh, I'm also an economist that embraces the identity of a human rights economist that believes that we should have structures, we should have resources directed in a way that uh, support our most treasured resource on earth, which I believe is people and the environments in which we live. And not simply in a charitable sense. I, I fundamentally believe that our most productive assets are people. If we want innovation, if we want dynamism, then I think we have a fiduciary uh, from our public sector to make sure that individuals are properly resourced regardless of the environment, regardless of the families or identity groups in which they may have been born. Uh, and I think uh, baby bonds is one example. So, you know, I, at the Institute, and I have several people here who work with me at the Institute, David Radcliffe, as well as Gary Cunningham, uh, we, we do three things. We, we have conceptions. We do research. To me, that's the truth-seeking stage, trying to understand how phenomena works. Then we translate that into ideas, into action, into policy. And then finally, public engagement to make, make those ideas, those policies sustainable. And we begin with a set of values, which is economic inclusion, civic engagement, and social equity. So I won't give you my whole spiel about the Institute. Uh, I'll, I'll just summarize uh, one of the big programs that we're vested in and why we're here today. Baby bonds. So baby bonds is focused on uh, ensuring that everybody has a capital foundation so that they can build wealth and have the economic security, and the treasurer uses this word a lot, the agency, uh, the, the sovereignty to be able to affect their lives over time. To me, that's justice. To me, that's a conception of justice. In a similar way that we think about civil rights, political rights, right? those are not concepts that I suspect any, anybody in the room would say that we should deny people. Well, similarly, I think people need resources to have the agency, the freedom, to be able to uh, live dignified lives, not just for themselves, uh, but to come up with the innovation, to come up with the dynamism, so that we all can have better lives. Speaking of being set up for failure, is following Dr. <laughs> uh, Hamilton. Uh, but my name is Eric Russell. I am the state treasurer from Connecticut. Um, and it's great to be here with all of you in Vermont and to be with Mike. Um, so Mike and I got elected at the same time and stepped into these roles. And uh, some of my core responsibilities as treasurer are uh, being the principal fiduciary for our state's uh, pension funds, uh, overseeing all of our cash and, and debt management and our 529 college savings programs. Uh, but what I think is really powerful about this role as treasurer is the opportunity to really look at long-term investments in our state. And so we can talk about that from a direct investment perspective in thinking about our pension funds, but we can also talk about it in investing in people. And I think that is exactly what we've been able to do with Connecticut Baby Bonds. I mean, it's really kind of breaking some of this, uh, the mold of thinking about this role in just the traditional way, but say, looking at how we can make investments in building a long-term future for our state where there is more economic opportunity and prosperity and fairness for everyone. Um, and so this was a very collaborative effort to get to this point. Uh, my predecessor, Treasurer Wooden, uh, was the uh, first person to roll out, working closely with Dr. Hamilton, the concept of baby bonds um, and uh, passed a statute in Connecticut back in 2021. And we'll get into some of these details, but essentially the program funds for every child born into poverty, which we use the state's Medicaid program as that indicator. Uh, there'd be $3,200 invested in a trust on behalf of that child. 
uh, those revenue, that those monies would grow over the life of that child and between the ages of 18 and 30 they could access those resources for purposes that are all around wealth creation. So purchasing a home in Connecticut, starting or investing in a Connecticut business, uh, being used for post-secondary education or job training, uh, or it could be rolled into a retirement savings account. Um, there was, the program was ultimately, the legislation was passed, was pushed off uh, for funding, and so when I came into office in January, one of uh, my primary responsibilities was really focusing on how we could work collaboratively and come up with a funding mechanism to get this program off the ground. Um, and starting on July 1st of this year, uh, we were able to fully fund the program uh, for the next 12 years, and the first uh, babies born into the program were born as of July 1st of this year. Um, and so I'm just excited to be here um, to help support this initiative as we we're talking about it here in Vermont, but understanding uh, the opportunity there is for uh, our states to really invest in our people. And I would just say, you know, on a personal note, I mean, I grew up in a community um, that is so tied in thinking about what, how beneficial this could be for people, right? I mean, I, folks who worked hard every day, who made money, but the difference between them paying a mortgage or paying rent for their entire lives is being able to have some access to capital to put down on a property. Um, and so um, we are doing a lot of work as we implement this program, uh, but just really honored to be here with um, this distinguished panel and to, to help support this initiative here in Vermont. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, thank you all for being here and thank you for the introductions. Um, Eric teased out some of the specifics of the Connecticut program, and in Vermont, we're modeling our legislation off of Connecticut. So, in Vermont, we would have the same concept. Every child born on Medicaid would be uh, eligible for baby bonds. So, in Vermont, it's about 2,000 children for, per year. Um, about 37 or 38 percent of all births in uh, Vermont. Uh, that money would be invested in the treasurer's office and would grow and the estimate is something like 11,500 at the age of 18 up to $24,000 by the age of 30. That's sort of the eligibility criteria and I'll ask sort of why that age frame was picked in a minute. And then similarly same four eligible expenses to buy a home in Vermont, uh, to start a business in Vermont, um, to uh, go to higher education or job training uh, or to roll it over into your retirement. So we talked about this as um, something that was addressing and attacking generational poverty, something that was uh, disproportionately helping rural areas from an economic standpoint, uh, and something that would help retain young people in Vermont as well. So those are sort of the four, or three, sorry, policy aims uh, of this program. So I wonder if maybe um, Professor Hamilton and, and Treasurer Russell, you can just talk about those four items that were selected. And um, maybe a question is why those four? Why sort of select uh, those as criteria for baby bond program? I'll defer to the godfather. <laughs> so Derek is the intellectual godfather of baby bonds. He didn't include that in his, in his self bio. But. The human emoji. <laughs> right, so, um, Right now, there's another policy that's gaining momentum, guaranteed income, and it's unconditional. Uh, so the purpose of putting conditions on baby bonds is not to be paternalistic, but imagine the context of a low-income individual that comes into, into their adulthood uh, with, with a set of resources being directed to them. I know myself, uh, you know, I suspect I have a similar narrative as Treasurer Russell, uh, I probably would have had an aunt that might have been vulnerable to eviction. And it would be a worthy cause for me to offer her resources to not be evicted, but it's not going to grow my wealth. So there's, we, we need to recognize that there are no one single silver bullet policy that's going to redress the conditions that we have, nor provide the agency that we're talking about, that these various policies work in combination and collaboration. So those four elements are chosen largely because the program is keenly focused on assets and building up wealth. So they're, they're intended to not protect the children from making uh, poor decisions, but rather to protect the children who become adults from the societal structures that inhibit them and their capacities to build wealth. Eric, anything you want to add? 
Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I, I think if, even in thinking specifically about all of these purposes, if you think about how most people uh, in our states and in our country have amassed wealth over time, it's been through ownership of something that appreciates without anyone having to do anything, right? And so really thinking about tying this to something, the ability for someone to purchase a home, again, that difference between having a down payment or not and paying rent for some extended period of time, um, but it's something that ultimately can allow someone to build wealth over time. It's how so many families refinanced their homes to help their child pay for school or to deal with some um, catastrophic personal finance issue that they've gone through, right? Um, and so, you know, I think all of these things are designated for that purpose. I think another thing, and this is me thinking about the, the reality of getting policy like this done sometimes, is that there are going to be people that have those questions about, is this money going to be used for the right purpose, or um, is it going to serve the goal that's really intended? And I think some of these parameters that are built into the program are were necessary things to get the program over the finish line from a just practical perspective. Yeah, no, it's a great point, Eric, around how policy is made over the state and federal level. Yeah. And, and, and real quick, I promise to be brief, but what, how is wealth generated for most Americans? Uh, we could probably ask ourselves in this room, how did you generate wealth? Most Americans don't generate their wealth from passive savings. Most Americans generate their wealth from an asset that passively appreciates over their lifetime, or having a, a career or a profession with the automatic tools like a 401k program where employers contributing to it, that's how, uh, for the typical American, wealth is built. So it, it's recognizing that, and uh, you know, some of the, I think the elegance in the idea is simplicity. It's literally providing you that, that capital foundation uh, to try to get into one of those assets. So a similar question, um, you know, just talking about the framing of, of the bill, um, you know, so you have those four sort of asset types that you can invest in, and you also designate 18 to 30, so sort of young, young people, um, younger people. You know, I'm assuming that was done with a strategic thought as well. Yeah, without, without a doubt, wealth compounds over one's lifetime. So if you, you know, if you really want to build wealth, you want to target it in an early point and one's life to build that economic security. And then, you know, one, one other aspect is that if you think about our public policy infrastructure, we don't have anything aimed at uh, development beyond subsistence for young people. We, we have one of our best public policy programs, Social Security, uh, where, you know, that's a great program, but it's targeted at the twilight of our lives or when we're heading towards retirement. Uh, so from the life cycle, you know, it's a pivotal point that can make a difference in, in uh, generational ways. And I would say, I think, you know, as we think about the program, it was very intentionally developed to be separate and apart from the parents, right? Is that this, the idea is that this program and these resources track the child. And so, um, if you think about just that timeline, one, it's that 18 year range where, one, I think, if, as was mentioned by Derek, right, the, the idea that if you are growing up in a community or have family that is struggling and you have access to resources, you are going to use those resources to help sustain your family. Um, with this, it's regardless of what family you're born into, regardless of what zip code you're born into, you have this access to capital to use for something that could ultimately change your circumstance in a meaningful way uh, moving forward. I think the other piece is just the, you know, from a policy perspective, um, is the economic opportunity for our states through this program. Um, this program, the way it's designed from this age range, allows uh, and incentivizes people to either stay in our states or move back to our states, no understanding that they can access these resources at a time that they are likely to be uh, starting a family or starting a career, um, and ultimately are going to reinvest these resources back into our states. So we've talked a little bit about the generational poverty aspect of baby bonds. I wonder if the panelists want to hit on that sort of rural economic development piece and, and why it's sort of disproportionately beneficial to the more rural areas of, of Connecticut or Vermont or, or the country. Okay. 
Well, I actually, so I wrote down as, as my colleagues were speaking, um, bear with me here, Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Jester. So that was my favorite book growing up. And I had the opportunity to go meet the author in Massachusetts, Norton Jester, was doing a book signing, and I didn't even know he was still alive. So, you know, I went to go get my book signed, and he said, oh, you're a policymaker. This was early in my 20s, and he said, you're a policymaker. You know what we should do is just give every baby born a college degree. That would solve all our problems. And, you know, of course, he's a very tongue-in-cheek, big-thinking kind of author, but you know, it, it made a lot of sense. I mean, what stands between a young person and a college degree? Um, it's, it's really usually just money. I mean, you know, Scott can tell you that. It's, they should be able to access any of those opportunities, whether or not we think they're qualified or ready. Um, you know, they should be entitled to that. They should grow up thinking, I, you know, I am meant to go and access something um, that's for me, that was set aside for me. And, you know, I, I mean, I guess I would just say in a place like Vermont, in our rural places within Vermont, there are a lot of people who think, I'm not going to be able to afford that. That's not for me. That's for folks in Chittenden County. You know, I'm never going to be able to to understand how to access that. I don't have teachers who are telling me, you know, that I can afford to go to UVM, etc. Um, so they're never going to ask the questions. They're never going to interact, bump into somebody who can help them, you know, understand that that opportunity truly was meant for them. And so I just think of it as a motivator. Um, and, you know, when I think about what, you know, just what else I heard, we have a policy here that I don't think it, it would be really high-minded of us to think it's an equalizer, but it's a great stabilizer. Um, there are so many people who can't see beyond a very um, desperate loop of poverty and you know just a very unstable life situation. And to know that one day you know there's there's money waiting for you, that your government, you know your state treasurer, um, set aside resources for you to be able to dream big. I, I just that's so huge, like. I just, you know, they often say for whether it's really blighted urban schools or, or really depressed rural schools that kids need to experience small victories. They need to just feel like they're winning some of the time. And, you know, just the idea that someone is, is counting on them and is believing in them um, to realize their full potential, that's, that's huge to just make the world bigger for you when you feel like your world is small in a rural school. Sure, so, I, and I appreciate all of those comments. I, I'm glad that you touched on them. Uh, on the, I think rural communities, so in thinking about Connecticut, this was really important to us in terms of being able to get this program over the finish line because I think uh, many people view Connecticut, we're one of the wealthiest states in the country, um, and people think of very uh, specific <laughs> communities in Connecticut when they think about the state very often. Um, the reality is that we have one of the largest wealth gaps in the country as well. and. It is a gap that has continued to widen. Um, and the communities in Connecticut living in poverty are not um, monolithic in any way either, right? So we have, certainly there's urban poverty, but we have a ton of rural poverty in Connecticut. Uh, I think where the, I think that was important to getting this done because we had to build really broad-based coalitions of support and understanding that there were going to be people from all 169 towns across our state who would benefit from this program. Um, but it's also about using this opportunity to reinvest in the state and reinvest in communities that have been under-resourced for so long. I think that piece of it is critical, uh, particularly when you think about our rural communities, right? Folks living in rural poverty. The likelihood is that folks who are accessing these resources are going to be reinvesting them, purchasing homes, starting businesses in the communities that, in which they live and grew up. Um, and so we see it as a huge opportunity to really um, further that development as well. So, you know, I'm going to build on those ideas and perhaps say something slightly controversial, but I promise not to embarrass the treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what do we do when an area becomes dilapidated? We strategically direct public resources uh, often by trying to bribe capital with tax incentives to come into the area to redevelop it. Uh, well, what does that do? It often 
uh, might improve the neighborhood, but the people that were there don't always, always get to benefit from it. And it also enriches those that already had capital. Uh, this, this is a little different. This is also an investment. And we should characterize resources going to poor people in ways that are meant to be developmental as investments. We often characterize them as costs. But this is investment. This is a redirection of public resources in a strategic way to communities that need it most. First and foremost, by directly funding those individuals rather than the place per se. Um, and then that also will have a spillover multiplying effect that will improve the areas. And, and the money will be going uh, because it's likely that poor people don't live in isolated communities. Poor people will often cluster and be together, or rural people who have less resources will be, cluster, will be at least somewhat clustered and live together. So it, it generates a different form of economic investment that will directly benefit those that need it the most, but also create a dynamism to improve those areas. So, um, one question I want to ask, uh, we have a couple more sort of broad-based questions and some more sort of detailed questions about the, the program, but I sort of asked this question in response to an email I got when we sent out an, this idea about the program and the person wrote back and sort of was struggling with how to characterize the program. Was it a progressive idea? Was it a pragmatic idea? Was it a democratic idea? Was it conservative? <laughs> and um, I think it's actually a little bit the um, beauty of it um, that uh, it, people can view it in, in different ways. So I guess my broad question is, like, who should support this bill? Why? And then maybe, Eric, you can talk a little bit about the experience in mm -hmm. Connecticut getting the bill passed and, uh, and the support for it. Sure. Thank you, sir. You want me to so I always tell this tongue-in-cheek story when I get a question similar to that. A good friend of mine, Lynn Paramore, wrote an article uh, entitled uh, Baby Bonds, an Idea Conservatives Should Love. Uh, and, and Lynn, I don't think, would characterize herself as a conservative. Uh, to me, uh, if you believe in markets, if you don't believe in markets, uh, a, a critical ingredient, if you do, is capital itself. Otherwise, that's not a transaction. If you have one party engaged in a transaction that has no resources, that's either uh, the whim of exploitation or the whim of charity in that engagement. So this idea is intended to properly resource people so that they can engage however you want to structure your economy. And again, this is part of uh, the framing of what we're applying at the Institute, where we're trying to reclaim this notion of rights, this, this notion of justice, and add economic rights to it. And it's, it's not, again, not this juxtaposition of capitalism or socialism per se, uh, but rather what are the necessary ingredients that people need in order to have dignity and authentic agency in their lives. So I, I kind of see it as that. Wealth is functional. The essence of wealth is not it as an outcome, but what it can do for you in your life. And those that don't have it, um, really uh, are limited in the agency that they have over their life. So uh, I, I, I think it's always funny when we have to take something like this and try to put it into a bucket, right? <laughs> rather than, than looking at what is just effective for helping people, right? And what we were able to do in Connecticut, and again, in building this broad-based coalition, we had support from uh, mayors and first selectmen in the state that understood that um, these resources would be invested back in their communities to help build them up. We had strong support from chambers of commerce in the business community who understood that this was an investment in building out a stronger, more skilled workforce of the future. Uh, we had residents who understood that this was going to be an incentive to keep people in the state and attract young folks coming back as they were starting their families. Um, we had legislators from across the state, understanding that there were folks from every corner of the state, from rural communities and urban communities that were gonna benefit from this program. Uh, we, it was so important to build that broad base of support um, and understanding that yes, there's a, a social uh, driver in trying to help people and create opportunity for people to lift themselves up, but that doesn't mean that this investment isn't a strong economic investment in our future as a state as well. Um, I think the other piece is, important to note is it's not as if poverty 
doesn't cost us something, mm -hmm. right? We are spending money, we are spending resources. Um, it, it impacts every component of our society and our way of life when folks don't have the resources that they need. Um, and so why not shift this conversation to say, rather than just looking at programs that are about helping someone sustain themselves on a day-to-day -day basis while they're living in poverty, looking at transformative programs that can allow individuals to lift themselves up and change their circumstance in a meaningful way. Um, and so I think that this is a program that does that. And again, understanding it is a piece to a much larger puzzle, but really has the ability for us to create a future that's different than the one that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. I would just add a couple things, and I don't want to let Democrats off the hook. Um, number one, when the treasurer told me you know, we, we often fight about where's the money going to come from, and it's a great idea, but, you know, our budget's so tight. Um, when the treasurer said he was going to start with unclaimed property, I said, thank God, you know, I'm in all these red states where the treasurer is like, and this won't cost taxpayers anything. We're going to use unclaimed property. There's a, you know, there's a huge wealth gap. I mean, I say controversial things all the time. The treasurer knows that. <laughs> there's a huge wealth gap between the younger generations and boomers. Um, and it's bigger than in any other country in the world. Um, and there's some unclaimed money sitting there, you know, sure, can people claim it? Yes, it's a huge pot of money. Um, but we should boldly say, you know, some of this can go to young people. This, you know, this is money that we need to invest in our children if we're not investing them through our other policy means. And if we need to supplement that with additional funds, great. But just letting it go to the general fund, I feel like as Democrats, you know, just sort of like, sitting on good government principles and not actually thinking about all the people that are in despair. So I was really grateful to see the treasurer not borrow something from the, the Republican treasurer playbook, but you know, just I think be bolder than a lot of Democrats um, have been. And then you know, I, I took a class with Cornell West and Roberto Unger at Harvard, uh, basically saying if progressives do not understand and navigate the means of production, they will continue losing elections. And we are never talking enough about workforce and housing on the left. Um, you know, we're, we're just not. I, I go to the other committees that I love and care about and say, we're not going to meet our climate goals, our health care goals, no other goals if we continue down this economic downward spiral of having no young people and really no one who can move here because of our housing and workforce challenges. And something like this is operating on a number of fronts. If you stay in the state, you, you know, you get to access this money and you know, think about what opportunities are available to you here. Sure, you could take it elsewhere, but you're going to go to institutions like VSAC. You know, you're going to go to financial um, navigators here in the state who are going to say, look at all these options that you have. You know, that is just, if we say we're investing in our 18 to 30 year olds, God bless us. You know, like we, we really need them. Um, and we need them to know that their state cares about them and is ready to transfer some of that wealth that's sitting there directly to them. I mean, real quick about the generational gulf. Uh, boomers came of age with the GI Bill mm -hmm. and FHA loans. Mm -hmm. uh, millennials came of age with the Great Recession and then the mm -hmm. pandemic recession. Mm -hmm. And at the age of 30, they had some of the generationally lowest home ownership rates uh, going all the way back to the greatest generation that came out of the Great Depression. So it was public policy that yielded uh, essentially whatever American asset-based middle class that we have. Now, of course, there were uh, intricacies that left uh, certain groups of people, like black people, out of the asset-based middle class. Uh, but we have a blueprint. And Baby Bronze is another example of the state seeding the capital resources so that uh, generations can acquire wealth. So just to put a finer point, just you know, in terms of a Vermont perspective on this question of like who should support baby bonds and the concept. You know, we're here in Winooski, which is um, one of the most uh, densely populated, most urban cities that we have in Vermont, one of the most racially diverse cities that we have um, in Vermont, and one of the uh, poorest cities from a sort of a percentage of those living in poverty. So you can see that baby bonds would have a disproportionate impact here in Winooski. And then contrast that with, with Essex County in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, one of the most rural areas of Vermont, one of the whitest counties uh, in Vermont, and also one of the most impoverished counties in Vermont. 
So I think this program is great in that it really targets the areas of the state or of a particular community uh, that need the support uh, the most. You know, I, I wanted to share a little anecdote that I, um, when we were working on the retirement savings program, I was speaking in like a church basement, you know, eating chili with some folks in Essex. And, you know, there are times, first woman of color ever to chair a committee, you know, let alone the first woman to chair economic development, where I'm thinking like, what are we doing that's really popular? And, you know, I brought up the retirement savings plan and this woman came up after, you know, older white woman, I didn't need to talk about it helping particular groups of people. And she said, you know, when I was young, I thought compound interest was something I'd have to pay. Mm -hmm. but, like, I heard interest and I ran the other way. And it was only in my 50s, as I was like getting ready for retirement, that I truly understood that I had really missed the boat. And so I just see these kinds of programs as really unifying, as taking everyone who just thinks, I never got a leg up, I, you know, the system's rigged against me, and just says, you know, we're going to make sure that you have access to just the same financial education that wealthy people pass on to their children. It's no more, no less. It's not, you know, some kind of extra. It's just universalizing financial tools that we created for these reasons and left huge chunks of the population out in the meantime. And sometimes, as people know, I put Color of Law by Richard Rothstein on my bookshelf when people come into my committee. Sometimes government did that to people, and it's our fault that we failed people with our policies. And it's really our job to right those wrongs, you know, no matter who folks are. Yeah. Well, um, another big question I wanted to ask, um, you know, this program, you know, if implemented in Vermont or as implemented in Connecticut, you know, 6.4 million annually in Vermont, uh, Connecticut set aside hundreds of millions of dollars for the program, you know, people will start to see the tangible benefits 18 years from now. So some would ask, well, aren't there more pressing problems right now that we should focus on? So it's sort of a two-part question. How do you address that? And then what are the here and now impacts that you're actually seeing from this program uh, in Connecticut? Yeah, so first I would say uh, it's why I give the treasurer and elected officials who are here today and supporting this program uh, so much credit because, and folks back in Connecticut who made this happen. Um, it takes a lot of political courage to step out in front of a policy or a program that, uh, frankly, I won't be in office when the ultimate benefit is paid out uh, to those recipients. I think for the governor and legislators and folks who got behind that, um, I think is really important. And I think it's a sign of what we need to be doing more of as we think about policy. Um, everything can't just be about a budget cycle. We can't address longstanding generational issues, thinking about them um, in some narrow kind of tunnel driven uh, way. Um, I think what's important in thinking about this funding is, is one, uh, needing to do something that has a set revenue stream or that kind of lock boxes a sum of money to the program. So that is something that goes on kind of in perpetuity or at least is funded for some extended period of time. Because there is always going to be this effort to kind of pit issues against each other. Um, to say, well, we could be spending this money on this other thing. And I think what we need to do is say that we can look at this holistically and understand that we need to prioritize things that we need to do in the short term. We need to make investments in our communities, but we also need to make some of these longer term investments to really change um, things in a bigger picture way. Um, and so I, th I think that is um, certainly was very effective in Connecticut. I think the other piece is just having to be creative about this. We, our program after being passed through the legislature back in 2021 was held up for a couple of years because of funding. Um, the program was initially going to be paid for in bonding. We were going to bond $50 million a year for 12 years, so a total of $600 million for the program. Um, the governor was not on board with bonding the program, and so it was stalled. And when I came in, the, the goal was to bring everybody to the table to say, let's look at some other creative, innovative ways to fund the program. Let's keep an open mind. Let's make sure everyone has a seat at the table in thinking about how we get there. Um, and what we were able to do through that um, collaboration and, and with looking at different ways to do this, we actually were able to fund 12 years of the program up front by releasing some money that we had in a reserve fund. Um, and we were able to take $400 million um, and move it into the Baby Bonds Trust. What it did was not only fund the program um, in full for that 12-year period, 
but because we were putting money in the account up front, we actually cut $200 million off the cost of the program, and then probably another $150 million or so of interest costs that we would have paid if we had borrowed to, to do it. So I say that in like, it's really thinking about this creatively. I think, Treasurer, your um, proposal here is very strong. It's taking resources that would not be dedicated to something, to a specific policy like this, and repurposing it to something that can be really effective and create a transformational program um, in the state, and also is going to do that year over year, uh, not just thinking about it in the one budget cycle perspective. So, yeah. you know, uh, th there's a lot of heroic stories that I think can be written about uh, this policy. Uh, Treasurer Russell is a hero. Uh, Treasurer Wooden is a hero. Uh, the, the pointing out the fact that this program won't pay out for 18 years, it's not the politically the, the most uh, expedient choice that you might make if your goal is strictly your career. Uh, but the ways in which uh, they transitioned uh, with this and were steadfast in their commitment to make sure that it, it got passed, uh, it took heroic efforts like that. And then now I think it's going to be a contagion. I'm excited and optimistic that you will pass it here in Vermont. It's poised to be passed in Massachusetts, but it takes heroic efforts of individuals uh, to get something seated and started. Uh, so the answer to the question of uh, what about uh, early education? What about um, uh, food stamps? What about food insecurity? The answer is yes to all of that. The answer again is there is no silver bullet policy. Um, but uh, all the education in the world is not going to solve the racial wealth gap. The typical black family with a college degree often has less wealth than the typical white family who dropped out of high school. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't invest in education. A, a good moral society should think of education in and of itself as worthy of an investment. Uh, but it also means that we need to be focus on redressing the intergenerational structures that generated that racial wealth gap in the first place. And then obviously, wealth poverty is not the exclusive domain of black people. There are a lot of asset poor white people for which uh, these important investments are not going to address. So you need it all. Our budgets are moral documents, and states are constrained in ways that the federal government isn't. So that is a reality. Uh, but it, it is going to take commitment, uh, commitment to justice, and it's also going to uh, take a realization that this truly is an investment. I mean, it, it, and there's plenty of examples. That period that we were citing in history, that, that New Deal period, that great <coughs> society period, we had a lot of growth in America. Productivity grubbled, doubled, um, and what's more, it was linked to about a 90% rise in real wages over that period. So there was almost a one-to-one -one ratio of growth with the benefits being spread out. Again, nuance. Everybody didn't benefit. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we can reconceive of the ways in which we invest public resources, again, in people with a purpose of, of generating a dynamic economy. Then the last point I'll just make also is we don't have to wait 18 years for the investment to pay off. Some people emphasize the aspirational aspect for a child. Uh, imagine if you get your, suppose you send out statements showing the child how much is reserved for them with the account. Mm -hmm. So with their, their 10th birthday, they see this account. Does that change their horizon? Now, I don't emphasize that aspect of the program that much. You know why? Because the aspirational part without the resources is almost cruel. Mm -hmm. So you do need the resource part as well. It will change horizons. But what's more, it changes the relationship between the state and a lot of the people who have a poor relationship with the state to begin with, uh, part because of history. Poor people are used to dealing with the state in punitive ways. Poor people don't vote sometimes because they don't believe it's ever going to make a difference in their lives. So the civic engagement associated with it is, the, again, a right thing to do, uh, but very well might lead to a better society for us all. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, what that made me think of is just, you know, we're coming up on the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act next year, and 
that's 60 years that we can look back and say, you know, yes, some progress was made at the tip of the spear, a black president, et cetera, but we did not accomplish a lot of what we set out to do. A lot of black and brown Americans still feel like they have been written, you know, a bad check by the government. Um, and we think, you know, maybe right now 18 years seems like a long time. We can't even pass a budget, like for more than a year in the federal government. But, you know, <laughs> states are where exciting things are yeah. happening, where we can say to people, hey, you know, not only are we going to give you a future that you can believe in, are we going to invest in you and not, not tell you that climate change or, or you know, our democracy are going to take out sort of all of your opportunities that we can't even look past the next few years, but we're going to do it in a multicultural democracy. We're going to do it in a way that really has those unifying principles that we never quite fully engaged with and got on board with. And I can't think of, you know, now that we're saying it, I mean, this is a great moment, the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, to work on some of that unfinished business of 60 years ago. So it's just, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's wonderful. I think of like that, that change in that relationship with government, like that old joke that I'm from the government, I'm here to help, right? And people sort of laugh at it, but it's true in this instance. And I think it can reframe um, individuals' relationship with the state and, and hopefully um, enhance civic engagement uh, as well. So a question I wanted to ask, um, and maybe it's very specific to, to Connecticut, but um, Eric and I were up early today on the morning drive at, at 7.30, and I um, warned Eric that there could be some tough questions uh, uh, that get called in, and just so happened Derek's flight was delayed after he heard that. <laughs> uh, but one of the questions, which was not a hard question, but the question asked, you know, we need to set up a new department to administer this. Like, what sort of administrative costs are there? What's the administrative burden? And I think, um, from my perspective, uh, one of the reasons I like this program is that I don't envision there being a lot of overhead. There certainly, from my perspective, doesn't need to be a new department. But I wonder, Eric, if you can talk a little bit about that. Like, what are the administrative pieces to this program in your office now, and then how do you see that developing over time? Certainly. So I, I think, particularly right now, there uh, are not many administrative costs to administering the program. We already collect data around children who are, whose birth is covered by Husky, which is our state Medicaid program. Um, so that information is there. There aren't individual trusts that are set up. We have a larger baby bond trust that the pool of resources goes into. And so the real process doesn't come up until claims are actually coming in at the point that children being born now turn 18 or, um, or later. Uh, at that point, we would likely be hiring um, an administrator, much like uh, our administrators for unclaimed property who process claims like this, who can confirm identity uh, and paperwork, and that would ultimately say, you know, if we were going to use these resources, or an individual is going to use these resources to go to UConn, uh, uh, national champion UConn Huskies, yeah. <laughs> 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 that, um, that, that invoice would come in from UConn, and that check would then go out um, to pay that. Um, what we are doing right now, and I think you know we've been able to do all of this internally, we probably will use maybe like a durational consultant at some point, but we're really looking, and this goes back to kind of that engagement over this 18-year window, um, we are looking to develop uh, programs. We've partnered with philanthropy and nonprofit organizations, bringing stakeholders to the table so that we can build in wraparound services and support and continue to engage with these children and their families throughout these next 18 plus years, right? Understanding that that engagement with parents around, even connecting them with existing resources in the state or existing programs. Again, understanding that a lot of these families haven't had positive experiences with government, right? Us bringing something positive to the table that they now have a reason to engage in a more meaningful way can allow us to connect those parents with existing things like workforce development training or financial literacy programming or uh, existing childcare resources that are out there. Uh, but also with partnering with philanthropy to say, hey, can we add on to this? We know this is a vehicle for connecting with some of the most vulnerable folks in our community. Uh, let's look at saying we can combine our 529 program and see if we have private donors that are gonna be willing to contribute to build that asset base for these um, children. Um, and so, you know, I think as we flesh some of those things out, the goal will be to partner those programs, even if we are providing more funding through philanthropy or through other resources, 
but really to beef up existing programs so those are not things that we're necessarily doing in-house. And maybe Eric, I can stay with you. It's another sort of specific question about the, the program. I think this would apply to Vermont as well. But you know, as students are getting the baby bonds and they're approaching going to college and they're doing their financial aid analysis or there are certain benefits that their family are getting, is there an impact on other benefits from having a baby bond or being eligible for a baby bond? And then what are the tax implications also of the child receiving the baby bond at age you know, 18 to 30? Great question, and we were uh, very intentional about this, and I, I know that uh, you did the same here in Vermont, but that the one, this resource that is sitting in the trust is not deemed to be an asset of that child until it is claimed, right? So um, at the time that this money is being invested in the trust fund, it would not impact that family or um, child in any way with um, kind of uh, income or, or asset thresholds for any programs. Um, and we also carved out that the once that these resources are received by a recipient, um, it would not impact um, them from a tax perspective. Uh, it wouldn't be considered income on the state level. We have been working, and this goes back to 2021 under Treasurer Wooden when the legislation was first passed, but with Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut and others uh, to make sure that legislation is passed um, on the federal level to make sure it would be treated um, the same. I think that was kind of put on hold in part because the program was put on hold, so there wasn't an immediate need to address it. Uh, but that's something we continue to pursue and that I think there would be a strong reception to. And just on that point, as more states end up implementing baby bond programs, hopefully more federal delegations will exactly. be engaged in that conversation as exactly. well. Exactly. And we are working with many other um, states around the country right now as is uh, Dr. Hamilton in, in really providing that support as folks are interested in building out uh, baby bond programs across the country. So I have a couple of broad questions that I want to ask and then you know just want to get the audience primed. If they have questions, we'll turn it over to you here in a minute. Um, but I wonder, Dr. Hamilton, you, you've talked about this before and I think it's interesting just to drill down on a bit from a sort of economic theory perspective. You know, at the state level, there's sort of progressivity built in because Medicaid is the eligibility criteria. But even in your initial proposal and in, in the American Opportunities Account Act, progressivity is built in so that um, potentially everybody gets something, but then there's income eligibility going forward. So why, from an economic standpoint, is that so important? And you know, it turns out that there's a lot of poor babies born in states. I, I, I became surprised at how many actually become eligible, and that, that's a little sad actually, but mm -hmm. uh, the, the answer to the question is, without the progressive aspect, uh, you ironically could end up making things worse. One, it could simply inflate asset prices if everybody just got the same across the board. And then the other part is you, um, would enhance the capacity of people with capital already. You, you would simply be uh, offering top off to those that, that have it already. Now there's something valuable about making it universal, similar to Social Security, uh, from a political standpoint as, we're, as well as a solidarity standpoint. You know, the extent to which we can create public policies that are not stigmatized, the better. Which is another reason why I like the rights frame so that it's not attached to some, uh, some status per se, uh, but you, you, get a, you as a human being get this resource so that you can uh, you know, engage. But the, the, the short answer is you want to avoid some of the asset inflation and also you want to make the effects real and uh, not enhance the capacity in an unfair way for those that already have capacity. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I think that's an important point. And uh, I know Senator Ron Hinsdale has been a big advocate of building more housing in Vermont for a similar reason that, you know, we need to increase that supply to take the inflationary pressure off home prices and, and rental prices as well. So a, a question I want to ask the whole panel, um, sort of thinking about, um, you know, we talked about generational poverty, rural economic development, <coughs> retention of young people in Vermont, um, but also I think if you even zoom out even further and think more fundamentally, like, greater and greater income inequality seems to be eroding even the foundation of our democracy. It's creating individuals that have no hope, that have no perspective to the future, that become angry, you can say rightfully so, because of the stat, stat, state of their condition. But I wonder your perspective on 
um, you know, how economic insecurity and how this, you know, this dramatic deviation in, in economic wealth has uh, impacted the state of our democracy, how baby bonds sort of works to try to address that, and what other programs, you know, might be needed to um, sufficiently answer that question. I, I, this might be a bridge from the last question to, to this question, but I, you know, I'm thinking about when, when Katie said it's it's a simple bill, I was like, oh no, you know, you can't say that in the legislature. But we see that as a compliment. Yes, yeah, to be fair, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, just it curses things. Um, but fair. To, to be a little bit of a legislative nerd for a second, I, I I can't speak for the House, but in the Senate, you know, we're really frustrated with programs that cost more to administer than the benefit that gets to people. We tried this with COVID relief. We've, we're, unemployment is having lots of problems right now. We are spending so much money to determine who's worthy mm -hmm. of support. And mm -hmm. it's it's just getting really frustrating. So, you know, of course, I mean, you want some eligibility as, as Dr. Hamilton pointed out, but the simpler you can make it and the less you make people feel like they're growing up with government saying, you're gonna do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. You're already a criminal. You're already, mm -hmm. you know, bad at making decisions. When you are poor and and being poor is stressful, and being poor doesn't let you think about your future. You know, it just changing the entire paradigm of like, we're gonna give you something that you deserve, that you are going to do good things with, and break cycles that you have wa been wanting to break. And that's a really different message that we give people um, ca coming out of government. You're cheating the system. You know, you're just trying to get ahead. You have to fill out 10 more forms. You have to come take time off of work to be here and prove that you're worthy. I'm sick of those programs, and I think uh, that sentiment is shared by a lot of legislators who feel like we're throwing money into a pit of fire, saying, like, we have to have this huge administrative apparatus to just deem people worthy of government help. I'll answer the question with first some stylized facts, and then <laughs> across race, inequality grows often at higher levels of education. So the difference between a black person with a high school degree and a white person with a high school degree is often not as pronounced as that of a black person with a college degree, white person with a college degree. And what's more, that relationship becomes more pronounced in economic downturns. So why am I giving you that stylized fact? Uh, economic inequality, political, polarization uh, feeds racism, feeds sexism. It, it, it uh, feeds some of these isms in our society uh, that make us vulnerable uh, broadly and also trend us away from justice. So uh, the, the ability to offer politically dominant groups economic stat, uh, relative status compared to another group becomes more pronounced in economic downtimes, becomes more pronounced when there's more economic insecurity. So really, uh, policies like baby bonds in general are not sufficient, uh, but necessary. With, with, with growing economic inequality, and we can look across societies and across times, this is not unique to the United States. Uh, you, you will find, uh, and, and I want to use a bad word, greater societal vulnerability to straight up fascism. So again, I think if we want a better society, uh, good public policies that invest in inclusive ways become a necessary ingredient. Yeah, I would just say, I think a lot of times when we talk about poverty and when we talk about um, income inequality, that we, we talk about poor folks as if people are choosing to be poor or if people want to be poor, right? Or this narrative about people not wanting to work, right? Hmm. Um, and the reality is that in so many ways, and I think in a growing way, the system is just set up to fail people. And it's why we've seen so much separation. It's why we've seen the wealth gap continue to grow. It's why we've seen folks with assets and wealth get exponentially wealthier while the pot of, or the pool of people at the bottom struggles more and more. And the reality is that we need to start shifting this conversation and thinking about creating policy and tools that 
um, allow people to lift themselves up and change that dynamic. And I think the reality is that it is just not sustainable. You have so many people who are just more and more disengaged from the process, more, uh, more and more distrusting of government and of uh, you know, just the political process more generally. And I think it's why we've seen just this huge divide. It's why the political landscape has gotten so ugly and so divisive. Um, and so I think, you know, as we are having these conversations the, and, and looking at policy, we need to just be intentional about creating opportunities for people to, um, to lift themselves up in a meaningful way um, and to create a, an economy that is more sustainable for everyone rather than just a few. Yeah, no, thank you all for your answers to that. That's, that's great. So this opportunity, I want to open it up to the, to the audience for any questions that folks might have. If, if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, just stay where you are, yell it out. I'll repeat it into the microphone so folks online can hear it. Lawrence. I'm curious about the geographic constraints. Naturally, it's a state program, so there's going to be some geofencing. Um, but we see kids, when they're minors, or as parents, they might show up on a Vermont tax return in even number of years and a New Hampshire tax return in an odd number of years. And then later in life, you mentioned um, Treasury Russell it's kind of attracting people, young people back to Connecticut, and we find they benefit from going out of state sometimes to Connecticut, right, and coming back. You know, just what are the mechanics? Is it an even contribution regardless of their location once they're deemed eligible at birth, and then the claims process kicks in? Just how do you, how do you make sure that works? So the question, just for those online, was really around geography and particularly in a state like Vermont, where we're close to our neighboring states and Connecticut, um, how does it work mechanically when someone born in the state might move away? Um, you know, what does it mean when they're at 18 years old but don't live in the state? Maybe Eric can uh, answer that question. Sure, happy to start. So um, the thought is yes, there would be flat funding, and the, the only eligibility requirement in Connecticut is that uh, the individual's birth is covered by the state's Medicaid program. Um, again, that was intentional because the thought here is that if you have somebody who was born in, to poverty in Connecticut and at seven years old, their parents pick up and move to Vermont, um, that child should not be detached from that opportunity. I think the other piece in thinking about the economic opportunity for Connecticut is we want that individual to come back to Connecticut when they're uh, 21 years old and they're starting a career and starting a family. Um, and so I think there's kind of um, the benefits to that on both sides. Um, I think it's also important to note that we did not want the program to be something that people had to opt into. And so what the Medicaid kind of requirement does is, again, understanding that a lot of the folks that we are talking about are not going to necessarily be aware of all of these programs. They're not necessarily going to trust engagement around that program. And so creating that automatic um, enrollment process really allows us to hit so many of the people who are most um, in need. And just one detail in like a place like Vermont, right, where you are in the Upper Valley and maybe you live uh, in the Vermont side, but you're born at Dr. Hitchcock, mm -hmm. you'd be born on Dr. Dinosaur who has the payment, so that would cover you there. Thanks, Lawrence. Yes, Scott. Um, I'm interested in this may be for Treasurer Russell. Um, you know, in terms of your thinking, but the power of this program amounts to a promise, but a promise that's being fulfilled in 18 years. And as these funds grow, I'm curious as to how you thought about how you safeguard the funds against the possibility that a future group of legislators or policy makers will have different priorities uh, with an amount with a pool of funds that are now. That's a great question, and it was something we spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, the way we've set this up in Connecticut is that there is a baby bonds trust, and that trust is safeguarded. And so there, you know, the, the legislature would not be able to go back to the pool and kind of raid this trust at any point. It is also helpful, and this was, I think, one of the best benefits, in addition to the savings from funding this with cash reserves rather than bonding it, is that we were able to take that pool of money and put it in the trust for 12 years of funding. Um, and we don't have to go back to the legislature or the governor at any point and see because we were going to need to ultimately get these bonds authorized on an annual basis. Um, the way we have this program funded now is it won't require us to go back. And so we're not kind of at the whim of the legislature changing or a new governor that maybe didn't agree with the program. 
Um, I think it's one of the important pieces about tying this to a set revenue stream because I think it is a lot harder when you make this commitment and you have a dedicated funding source to go back and try to pull the rug out from under kids. Um, but you know, I, I think in, in keeping those things in mind, I think the trust is the most important piece in making sure that it's essentially lockboxed for that purpose. I would just I'd also maybe add to that question and say, you know, I think it's probably important, Eric, to like continually reaffirm the value of the program to your constituencies in Connecticut, legislators, stakeholders. So it's not the program that's passed and then it's sort of a passive thing until you know age 18. I totally agree, and I, I think that's part of our wanting to continue to be engaged with kids throughout this process, looking at these partnerships with stakeholders and philanthropy and kind of continuing that engagement. It is challenging, right, because you do have this really long runway before the ultimate benefit is paid out. I also think that's a huge opportunity to interact with kids and families in a way that we haven't been able to uh, previously. Um, the other piece of, of that kind of philanthropic collaboration is around data and research, right? We want to make sure, uh, particularly being the first state in the country to pass this legislation and to implement it is to make sure that we're going to have things, um, data to rely on uh, in the future, to show if there's a changes in behavior and engagement from these kids and families that are benefiting from the Baby Bonds program, right? If some of these other additional wraparound supports are having a, a benefit on kids uh, built into the program so that we can make sure we have um, the backing for continued support of baby bonds moving forward and for the implementation of the program in other states around the country. A, a quick shameless plug is uh, we, we, we need a political movement to ensure that the, the program and the accounts can be secure. So why not work on demonstrations now, right? There's a, I get in trouble for saying this, there's nothing magical about babies. We can, we can start uh, with a, 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 a being tongue in cheek. I hope Vera wasn't listening. Ear muffs. But seriously, uh, you know, obviously I was being tongue in cheek, but we, we need to build a political momentum now. So through demonstrations and showing the affects. Uh, so when, where philanthropy can help is. Uh, yielding a big, bold demonstration at this point across geographies, across uh, various groups, so that uh, this program uh, has political viability and is invulnerable. Uh, here and then, then here. Yeah. Hi, I'm short. I got to stand up to be seen. <laughs> um, I'm Shabnam Nolan. I'm the executive director of an organization here well, in Burlington uh, called King Street Center, and we're a youth development organization serving children from 18 months up through 18 years and increasingly beyond that. And we really focus in on serving our most marginalized communities, our low-income communities. And, and you talked a lot about the trust or our distrust that government and low-income families have you know, with government. And I'm curious what strategies Connecticut employed or you know, Dr. Hamilton, what, what strategies you would recommend in terms of the connecting with nonprofit organizations who are in fact the trusted places for these families. You know, we see families come for decades to the center. So what would you suggest for how Vermont can engage now um, with development and implement, you know, and implementation? So how did you seek and gain input from the communities who are most impacted by this as you were developing the policy and then how do you intend to continue to do that partnership? That's a great question. So part of, in, in terms of building the political will uh, for the program, we were very intentional about partnering with community organizations. Um, one, to get buy-in from those organizations so that they could lobby and push for this legislation, that they understood the program, right, and the benefit, um, but also to make sure that we were actually hearing from folks who would benefit from the program, right? Not developing this policy or thinking about implementation kind of in a silo. Um, and so that was really important. Um, we are continued that work because I think what we need to do now, um, one big piece of this is making sure that everyone who is actually eligible and, and can benefit from the program is notified of the program and how it works, right? Um, if we're gonna track changes in behavior and, you know, 
um, throughout these 18 years, folks need to know that that resource is there for them and how it actually works. Um, and so we've continued that engagement, one, in getting ideas on how these collaborations with philanthropy and nonprofits can kind of, we can build out these additional wraparound services that will actually benefit recipients and families. Um, but two, to make sure that they are voices for us um, in spreading the word about the program and how it works and how people can benefit from it. Um, and so we did a lot of programming through the campaign um, in collaboration, going into the community with these organizations, being the validators for us, right? Um, and then we will continue to do that as we do outreach um, to families to notify them of the, the program. When the story gets written about Connecticut, there's gonna be so many gems and jewels in there. The nonprofit community was very much involved in making sure it got passed when it was vulnerable. So they, they I, I think Connecticut, they've been along throughout the journey and uh, you know, it was a, such a heavy lift to get it funded uh, that we'll, we'll even see some more of the fruits, I suspect, of the collaborations and what the wraparounds will come about uh, going forward. Yeah, great question. Dan, yeah, um, I'm Dan Toll. I'm the head of a, a process improvement consulting practice focused on ending homelessness and dramatically improving the lives of people like myself with uh, major mental health issues. First of all, I want to thank you, Mike, and you, Keisha, for organizing this and expending political capital on this really, really exciting uh, initiative. As someone who's a finance and investment person by trade, the intersection of finance and investment and social change just really gets me excited. And, and thank you, too, Dr. Hamilton and, and Treasurer Russell for traveling all this way to share your perspective, your expertise. And I've discovered the Vermont way is first name, so you got to give her to this doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you were about to say so I was trying to be Vermont. I'm actually from Connecticut. I moved here from Connecticut, so. But, um, I, won't, I won't hold that against up. you. <laughs> Go husband. <Yeah. laughs> um, the thing I was thinking about, and this is my real first exposure to this initiative, but this idea of the 18-year time horizon, you know, we in America are, are so focused on the here and now, and you know, corporations, it's the quarter to quarter. Have you explored ideas of, of, of making interim payments? Like, like, for example, halfway to 18, at, 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 at when they turn nine, just back of the envelope, you said about 11.5 at 18, 11,518 is about, at, at nine, so call it 7,000. Taking like 10% of that and paying it out um, and exclusively for use for education uh, or, or training. So they could put it in like a, what is it, a 529 savings account. So that would, would get, get that money uh, into into the hands of the people we want to have it using it sooner, but also sort of bring back that time horizon from 18 years, which for most of us in this room, in this country, that's like 12 lifetimes. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I just, I'll take two parts of it and I'll turn it over to the, the panel. I think one of the reasons I like this program so much and, and our other legislative initiative that's centered around Hinsdale was so supportive of last year, Vermont Saves. Um, it's a publicly administered retirement program. Both of those programs in the long term are going to have big benefits to the individuals, to their communities, to the state's budget. It'll make people less dependent on state resources. It'll give them more financial security. It will make them more economically independent. It'll benefit our economy. And they're long-term horizon programs. And like Eric said, and you said, you know, the next political campaign in Vermont is every two years. The next quarter is within the next couple of months. Right. You know, we're so focused on the short term um, that I think we lose sight of that long-term trajectory of where are we heading and, and how do we um, set our sights on it and get there. So just from a fundamental basis, I like the program because it's thinking, you know, longer term. One thing we also thought about in, in the Vermont bill, we have a, a, a study in the bill that would have us look at how can we invest <coughs> some of the money that will be set aside into the Vermont economy in the here and now. So for example, could some portion of the funds be used to support housing development in Vermont, uh, addressing one of our other critical issues that we're facing. So it might not be a direct benefit to the individual account holders, but it could be a benefit to society by putting more capital into things that are um, 
a real challenge right now in our state. So that's one way that we're thinking about trying to make more impactful investments here and now as those uh, returns grow over time. But I know Eric and Derek and Senator Rami and so probably have thoughts too. Okay. Right, right. So the, the political dimension is real. Uh, you know, I think of history and Social Security and President Roosevelt said, you know, Social Security is set up as a trust. You pay in when you're working. You receive when you uh, retire. But the funds went out as soon as the legislation was passed. So they had that capacity because they were the federal government. Uh, states need time to build up the funds so that there'll be a size big enough to have a meaning to be a capital foundation. That, that's a reality. Uh, but the point you make is that, from my standpoint, is that we do need political momentum around this. So it needs to be coupled with demonstrations. And then also, we set the program up if we believe it's going to be a, set it up for failure, if we believe it's going to solve all our problems. It won't. It has a specific aspect that it's aimed at addressing. And if we expect it to do more than that, it's going to fail. You, you need those other supports as well. Uh, so, you know, again, this last thing I'll say on this is we need movement. We need a social movement. And Vermont leads. You know, we can name states that lead in this area. Uh, you, you all as a state have had a long history of doing innovative things that outside the box thinking um, in ways that help build the movement. And then, you know, I love that this is not isolated to Vermont, that you have two treasurers from two different states that are working together um, in movement building at local level, state level, and federal level. That, that's the way I guess I would think of this. I would agree. I would, I would just think that there's, you know, I'm thinking about two separate real goals there, right? Um, and I, I think to uh, Derek's point, um, this is one piece to the puzzle and we need to continue to look at other ways to lift people up and provide those supports in a host of different areas. Um, but I think this program is really intentionally focused on building, um, with the goal of building wealth. So having those longer term assets that are going to be able to appreciate it. And I think once you start divvying those things up or you make the pool of money or kind of focus of that too small that she doesn't have the same um, impact. I think the other piece is again, making sure that we are protecting and insulating individuals benefiting from the program from either exploitation and thinking about, you know, these payday loans and things or being able to use resources and, and being taken advantage of in that way, or the desire and a lot of times necessity in supporting family or others in that immediate kind of uh, challenge of, of living in poverty. The only thing I would add is just, it, as much as I think we're forward thinking and very progressive in Vermont, none of us are immune to the zero sum game thinking of, well, we have a real big emergency and we can use some of this money now to help families and that kind of lets us off the hook to help them in other ways that, that we should be helping them with our budget. So, you know, I just, I can't see us just doing that out of the goodness of our own hearts and solving a lot of those problems of poverty and desperation without looking at our larger general fund and being more courageous there. So I would just worry about the drawing it down before. And, and just a nine-year-old, you know, like, we all were, like, that's where the legislature can be paternalistic. I don't know, to a fault, but, you know, we really look at brain development. We really want to talk about, you know, age of decision-making a majority and Sometimes my colleagues push maybe too far than I would like as a young person, but you know, we really look at trying to make sure we set young people up for success and not say, oh, we gave you some of this where, when you were nine, like well, where is well, it now? The thought was, would be to go to the Guardian, and, and yeah. was, I was thinking more along the lines of five to 10% of Yeah. Okay, so just a small, yeah. this right. would be about $700. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that, oh yeah. Wait, Do wait. you mind if I just say something? Yeah. Uh, Wei Wei Wong, the uh, Professionals of Color Network. I think something that Dr. Hamilton had addressed um, earlier, I think, is that we're giving children the choice of what they mm -hmm. want to do with the money. And that is very important around the agency idea, right? Making sure that they are anchored in this community, that this community wants to support them. And it's not about the parents, it's about the child. And that's really what the focus is on, is that future generation and making sure that they have the choice to build a home, to go to school, to, to do whatever, to build a business in, this, yeah. in the state. I, I would just, you know, I speak for no one, but as, as a child who grew up poor, 
in certain contexts, like one of the privileges you, you, you lose is just being a kid. Mm -hmm. You're cashing your parents' checks, mm -hmm. you're you know, taking care of them, you're, you're making money for your parents, and you never get to say like, I have something for me that's set aside. And mm -hmm. so I feel like we're talking about baby bonds, but we're talking about like so much more, <laughs> you know, that this is, it's really just belief in kids and their future mm -hmm. and investing in their agency at the right time and, and not, you know, making them become adults too soon and, and lose that capacity to dream. A lot of 14-year-olds with phone bills and light bills. Cell phones, yes. I think, Dan, I think the broader point is like, yes, we gotta figure out ways to like make this meaningful along that path to 18, yeah. right? And we have to keep an open mind as to what that will mean. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Peter. Uh, so thinking about the outreach around the program, but also the other thing that you know folks need to make uh, to build wealth is financial literacy. I know there's a financial literacy component to this program, this proposal. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so just for the folks on the phone or on the online, the question is around financial literacy and how that's incorporated into this program. I'll maybe just start with a broad perspective and turn it over to Eric. You know, I, one of the other reasons why I like Vermont Saves and I like this program is because I view it as like interactive financial literacy. Like it's not just showing up and getting a lesson on what does it mean to buy a house, what does it mean to save for retirement. It's a program that then facilitates you to do those things, right? So it's like here and now, which I think makes it much more actionable and much more meaningful. So I think financial literacy is a key thing that we have to focus on in Vermont. We've been a little bit behind the curve in terms of our scoring across uh, other states. Um, but when we can create these programs that are interactive, I think we'll get much more bang for our buck um, from trying to uh, ingrain these lessons into, into individuals' thought processes. Sure, and so, so we do have a, a financial literacy requirement as part of the program as well before individuals access resources. I mean, I think some of the specifics of that are going to be ironed out as we still have uh, many years to put that together. Um, but I, I think what's important to note with this, right, is that even when we talk about financial literacy, financial education, um, we often talk about it from a perspective of people not knowing how to manage the money or not having any financial knowledge when the reality is, is that without resources, it doesn't matter, right? And so to try to have someone focus on financial literacy with their with, uh, with lack of resources is cruel in many ways, right? Um, the goal here will obviously be for individuals to be able to develop those skills that they would need to, to use these resources well, but I think we also don't want this to be prohibitive in a way that's preventing from people from uh, accessing um, the resources. Um, another thing that we just recently did in Connecticut is we actually passed a uh, requirement for financial education um, before graduation. Um, and so some of this is going to be built in for students um, through that process as well. We will have some additional courses. I think I'd love the idea of, depending on what an individual wanted to use those resources for, having there be some specific curriculum around that purpose. Um, but that's all kind of being uh, fleshed out right now. Yes? I'm going with the Center for Women and Enterprise for the Vermont Women's Business Center, and I'm like out of my mind at this <laughs> prospect and what you have to share. Um, we see um, hundreds of women come to us each year who are looking to start and grow their businesses, and usually the amounts they're looking for are five, mm -hmm. ten, mm -hmm. twenty-five thousand dollars, and the ability to access that capital affordably and relevantly, right? Like that it's gonna work for the, the business owner is very, very difficult. And what this is promising is is really exciting. So Dr. Hamilton, you had mentioned a little bit about that multiplier effect and I assume that you've seen done some modeling around what were some of the ancillary um, partnerships or where do you anticipate additional programs for example, um, okay, we know that you're going to um, uh, start a business with these funds. Um, the local community loan fund, for example, might, uh, sorry, Vermont Community Loan Fund, I don't know if anybody's here, but um, <laughs> might um, offer zero cost loans or something mm. like that, right? Um, just for recipients of this. Have you seen any kind of proliferation of additional partnership programs? I mean, that's, that's a great question. Uh, so I've seen the modeling on individual levels as it relates to the racial wealth gap 
and Naomi Zudi has a great study in the review of black political economy that looks at it at the federal level at a higher seed. Uh, the answer to the uh, dynamic macro effects, I turn to history a little bit, uh, and it, so it's, the evidence to me is a little anecdotal when I look at periods of history when we invested public resources in, in, in these ways, what were some of the outcomes. But you know, I think we could even look, and, and this hasn't been written yet, um, or fully analyzed yet, but our recent economic downturn in the pandemic, which was a lot of pain, a lot of horror, uh, a lot of people suffered from, uh, I guess we can call this a short-term inflation uh, in a historical sense, but it was real pain and suffering. Uh, but this was the shortest recession, uh, at least in my lifetime, or that I'm aware of, I think on record. Uh, and then if we look at the, the recovery from this recession, uh, we, we didn't have the, long, the longer drawn out recession that we had from the Great Recession. And I think government interventions in this time around uh, were done in ways uh, not so different than some of the things that we're talking about today. It was direct stimulus sent to the American people from the IRS with those checks that went out. Uh, it was, you know, we, we had a, a moratorium on foreclosures, a moratorium on eviction. Uh, we almost had essentially guaranteed health care uh, as we dealt with the, the pandemic. So um, I didn't give you a direct answer. I gave you some anecdotes from history. Uh, but if one were to do a deeper analysis, you know, I really believe one will uncover that this form of government intervention not only directly benefits the targeted recipients, uh, but very well leads to more efficient uh, multipliers in a way that promotes shared prosperity. So we're running short on time. Maybe we'll have one more question here from Bill in the back. Uh, well, first of all, thank all of you, treasurers and economists and uh, your daughter. Well, here I'm sure eventually. Um, but it's, it's, well, it's pretty clear. I, mean, I can't get the metaphor. I'm not, I'm not sure what he's trying to get on the beach and then you fight your way inland, but um, or you just get the flag up the pole and everyone will salute. But it's clear from the, just the energy of your comments and many others that the excitement will. Um, Will be the dividend between now and 18 years, or maybe it will be 10, as, as was suggested. But in the, what you call wraparounds, I mean, as that unfolds, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Congress sort of said, you know, let's 529 this or somehow. I mean, I ran out of kids and grandchildren for my 529. I was grateful to be able to do that. But, uh, you know, how can we help? You know, and I think different generous folks in this community, and Vermont has lots of them, and uh, well, we'll find ways to bang on your door to get this train on the, on the road or the service open or whatever. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I think that, I'll take that as a comment, a great closing comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before we thank our uh, esteemed panelists, I do want to um, thank the legislators that are in the room. I want to recognize Dan Noyes, Representative Noyes, who is the lead bill sponsor on the House side for, yes. <laughs> Representatives who are, who are watching or here in person, if they want to learn more about the bill or thinking about being a co-sponsor, I suggest they reach out to Dan. For those that um, are in the Senate, Senator Ron Hinsdale is our lead bill sponsor in the Senate, so I encourage you similarly to reach out. To this was like a mini committee session. I also want to call to action, I want to recognize David Kunin, who's our Outreach and Communications Director. Thank you for helping put the event on, but also if organizations in the room are interested in writing an op-ed, interested in testifying, interested in writing their legislators, reach out to myself or to David. We'll help coordinate that activity in the new year to make sure we're coordinated uh, and organized. I um, also just want to generally thank the Treasurer's staff who's here, who've helped us uh, move this uh, program along and 
helped us close out a strong 2023 also. So thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Look forward to what we can accomplish in 2024. Thank you. Thank you.